Hello, everybody. I'm Daniel, and welcome to the Gator Truth Florida Football Podcast. On this first episode, we are going to look at the offensive position groups, and I'll tell you whether they'll be better or worse than they were in 2021. Before we begin, let's look at some offensive numbers from last year for both the Florida Gators and the Louisiana Raging Cajuns. UF was 15th in yards per game with 462.8. They were 46th in passing with 254.2 yards per game and 23rd in rushing with 208.7 yards per game. The Raging Cajuns were 64th in yards per game with 404.8. They were 78th in passing with 217.7 yards per game and 40th in rushing with 187.1 yards per game. Obviously, Dan Mullen is known as an offensive guru, and that explains some of the Louisiana UF discrepancy from last year. But also another possible explanation that I've heard thrown around is that Levi Lewis, the quarterback at Louisiana, is a limited type quarterback and that with his limitations, it held back some of the possible passing, and that's what led to being 78th in passing. We shall see, as Anthony Richardson definitely seems to be a better quarterback and possibly a better athlete than Levi Lewis. I don't know Lewis personally. I've only seen a little bit of him on film, but with that said, that's some of the just rumors or at least discussion that are out there for the difference in what we hope to see between the offense at Louisiana last year and the offense we hope to see at Florida this year. One statistic I think that will really tell the tale between Louisiana's winning season last year and UF's losing season is Louisiana was third in the nation with only eight turnovers throughout their 14 games. Meanwhile, UF in its 13 games tied for 100th with 21 turnovers. Obviously, if you're turning the ball over that much, your chances for success go extremely down. Overall, I do think the offense may take a small step back, but it could be close or it could even end up better. And we'll get into some of those reasons why as we go through these different position groups. To begin the position groups, we're going to go ahead and start with the most important position on the field, the quarterback position. Anthony Richardson will be taking over for Emory Jones as the starter. Last year, Emory Jones was inconsistent in 2021. He did share the SEC lead in interceptions with Will Levis from Kentucky. And if you take out his Vanderbilt and non-conference games, he had six touchdowns and five interceptions on the year. The reason why that number is kind of relevant is last year, Anthony Richardson finished with six touchdowns, five interceptions total against all competition. Now against the same competition, he had three touchdowns and four interceptions against the same teams. However, Two of those interceptions were against a great Georgia defense, and we will get into that. Now, when you look at the two games where both players really shared a significant number of reps, the LSU and USF games, both on the road, Anthony Richardson did look like the better quarterback. Now, with that said, he didn't look great against Georgia, as we alluded to. However, It's hard to judge a redshirt freshman quarterback when he's playing against a team or at least a defense that had eight players drafted. Five of those eight players were drafted in the first round. That is an unreal defense. And I don't think to judge a guy in his first start against a defense like that is a fair judgment, whether it's being done inside Gator Nation or outside of Gator Nation. And also... Outside of the three-minute stretch to in the first half, he was doing pretty decent. We can talk about maybe some mistakes here and there. We can also talk about whether or not play calling helped him. It did seem to be a lot more conservative than against LSU. And, of course, against LSU, he led us on four straight touchdown drives. Three of those were through the air, one on the ground, including a two-point conversion, which he ran in. 
Now, some of the positives of Anthony Richardson that I believe will cause the quarterback position to be better this year is last year we were seeing him read the field. We saw him progressing from target to target and looking off safeties and doing this stuff. I would encourage anyone look at the Gear Nation football podcast. They did a great job breaking down what looked to be Anthony Richardson looking off safeties, going through his progressions, making his read, and most of the time finding the right one. Another reason why I think AR will make the quarterback position better than it was in 2021 is that there are many times we've seen him make quick reads and also have a quick release. An example of this is the slant touchdown he had, I believe it was shorter on against LSU. He sees the matchup that he wants, gets the ball and quickly gets it out low, only where his receiver can get it. And that was for six. And as we're talking about low and away, Anthony Richardson's ball placement is better than what we saw from Emory Jones. Much of Emory Jones' throws seem to be where the guy was or a little bit behind the receiver. And I'm not trying to knock Jones. I'm trying to make a comparison. I believe Emory Jones was a great Gator, great teammate. I just don't think he was great at the quarterback position last year. But anyways, getting back to the ball placement, it is very important. If you're throwing the ball in front of a receiver, then it gives the receiver time to keep in stride. Just doing a little bit quick math for you. If someone's running a 540, and of course we know these defensive backs run even faster than that, but a five second 40 is eight yards per second. If the receiver has a one yard gap, has that small separation, if you throw it behind, they've got to slow down. Of course, the defensive back is going to catch up. They're going to knock the ball down. However, if you put it in front of them, Maybe the receiver gets a little bit more yak. Even with, let's say, two, three yards of yak before they're tackled, those two, three yards over four, five um, receptions, we're talking eight to 15 extra yards just from ball placement. And also less chance for turnovers if it's put in front of the receiver. One more positive of Anthony Richardson from what I've seen is he's got great vision as a ball carrier. Now, I'm not just talking the highlight plays we saw against Florida Atlantic, against USF. I'm also talking about some plays that we saw against LSU. One example, of course, being the two-point conversion where he seems to be rolling out to the outside to the right, cuts up the middle, cuts through, gets the two-point conversion. He also had a play in that game where he was going to be running inside, looked like the air was blocked, and he cuts to the outside for over a 20-yard gain. I do think that we'll see a lot more of that as you know he grows in his experience and as he grows as a player. He's only a redshirt sophomore. Areas I believe that he could improve, though, is Anthony Richardson needs to live for the next play. What I mean by that is four of his five interceptions last year was when he was throwing on his back foot while rushed or while he was being hit. Obviously, the trajectory of the ball changes if you're throwing off your back foot. And also, if you're being hit, you're not going to throw an accurate ball. The best example of this, in my opinion, is the interception that, for all intents and purposes, ended the LSU game. A guy comes in on him. He's got Rick Wells deep. If he was able to set his feet, I believe he throws it, hits Wells in stride. It's either a big pickup or it's a touchdown. Unfortunately, he leans back trying to get the ball off. Ball sails and it comes up short and ends up being an interception. Now, he also had that fumble against Georgia where he was fighting for extra yards Maybe at some point when you got several defenders on you, just go down, live to fight for another down. With that said, he's got the raw tools. We've also seen tools such as reading the field, great vision as a ball carrier, things that are only going to improve with time and experience. Staying in the backfield, we're going to move on to the running back position. I do believe that the running back position will be better in 2022 than it was in 2021. I know that there can be some questions on, well, we just lost a great back in Damian Pierce. 
how, Daniel, can you say that the running backs will be better? Well, here's why. The first thing is Jabbar Jaluk has taken over for Greg Knox. I don't think there's anyone in Gator Nation that's going to argue that Jabbar Jaluk is not an upgrade over Knox. And also, we did lose Malik Davis. With that said, we are returning Naquan Wright, we are returning Lorenzo Lingard, and we do have Montreal Johnson, the last year's Sun Belt Conference freshman of the year at running back, coming over from Louisiana. So, why do I think it's going to be better with the fact we lost two guys for your experience in Damian Pierce and Malik Davis? Well, first off, I believe the loss of Pierce is lessened a little because he wasn't like a workhorse back. He only got limited carries and sometimes limited use even when he's doing well. An example would be the USF game last year. I believe it was the second or third drive of the game. He gets the ball three times for 43 yards and touchdown, has two carries the rest of the game. We saw a lot of that, and until Dan Mullen was fired after the Missouri game, at that point, Damian Pierce was second on the team in carries. Due to that limited use, I believe it's a little bit easier to replace than if he were a featured back or even took a bulk of the carries. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not saying that we won't miss him. I just think it's easier to replace his production and for the running backs to be a little bit better due to that limited use. And also, I do want to quickly stop and say, Malik Davis, I really liked him. I don't think he was ever the same after his injury. He was definitely a solid guy. One of his highlights last year, of course, was that big touchdown run against Bama, where he stayed up despite several hits, kept going until he ended up in the south end zone. Naquan Wright, uh, I believe many people have been sleeping on. He does return, and I think some of that was he didn't go through spring due to injury. He was solid both in the running game and passing game in 2021. The biggest highlight was his 99-yard drive against Alabama, or the 99-yard drive against Alabama, where he had multiple big runs. But the key play that sticks out to me is that third down where the ball comes at him high. He reaches up through the air, grabs it, comes down, makes a man miss, and ends up getting the first down, which was key to Florida staying in that game. I also believe that Lorenzo Lingard getting his time to shine will be great. And he has a top end speed that, just being frank, Malik Davis and Damian Pierce did not have. That's a new dimension. And Montreal Johnson seems to be a great combination of everything, size, speed. Last year, he had a 99-yard touchdown run against Arkansas State, which, if you watch it, reminds me a lot of the long touchdown run that LaMichael Pirine had against Auburn in 2019, which to this day, you know, almost three years later, we still see all over Twitter and YouTube. And it's just one of those highlights that sticks out throughout the years. If you can, find that 99-yard touchdown, and you'll see what I mean. I also believe that one thing that's going to help the running backs be better this year, as opposed to 2021, is I believe the staff will go with a hot hand. For example, last year, each running back, they came in on their drive. You know, one, two, three, one, two, three, Davis, Pierce, right over, over. And for the most part, you didn't see any break from that. We go back to what I talked about with the USF game just a little bit ago where Pierce got three carries for 43 yards, got two carries the rest of the game. I do believe that Billy Napier, Jabbar Jaluk, Rob Sale as offensive coordinator, I do believe that they see one guy as being more effective than the other. He's going to get the bulk of carries that game. These guys are used to running back by committee. They did it last year at Louisiana while Rob Sale was at the New York Giants, but year before he was at Louisiana doing the same thing. And they're going to go with a guy. Like if Lingard is running like crazy all over Kentucky, he'll probably get the bulk of the carries. If Montreal Johnson is doing well against Utah, you bet he'll probably end up with the bulk of the carries. If Naquan Wright is doing something amazing against Tennessee, 
he may get the bulk of the carries. That's something we didn't see last year. Whether there's a guy just killing it or a guy struggling, it happens. Sometimes it's just based on the team or just who knows what happens. But point being, the staff will probably go with a hot hand and adjust once they see what's working, what's not, who's getting the job done, and who's not. Also, perhaps we see a running back in the slot, like we saw Brandon James a little bit back in the day. You know, we're talking about how we lack some speed at the receiver position. That could be a great way to get some of these guys reps and also create mismatches with a defense. The biggest thing that I think will help the running backs be better in 2022 is the offensive line. I do believe the 2022 offensive line will be better than the 2021 offensive line at Florida. Once again, let's look at the coaching changes. Rob Sale, Darnell Stapleton, take over for Hevesy. No one is going to argue that these guys are not better at their job than John Hevesy. We do lose Stuart Reese. We do lose Gene DeLance from last year's starters. However, we do have some guys who transferred in from Louisiana in Osiris Torrance and Cameron Waits. Looking at the projected starters for Florida in 2022 at left tackle, Garage, who's been a multi-year starter now, has played multiple positions on the line, was solid in 2021, gets a start at left tackle, protecting Anthony Richardson's blindside. At left guard, we have Ethan White, who while he was healthy last year, was solid. We also have Kingsley Egwakin at center, who, again, was solid and looks to build off his 2021 campaign. At right guard, we do have Torrance taking over for Stuart Reese, and I believe this is a bit of an upgrade. One, because in three years, Osiris Torrance has given up zero sacks. In fact, the interior of the offensive line in all their experience has given up zero sacks combined. Now, Torrance is also a preseason All-American. I don't think we can argue that he's not going to be an upgrade. Granted, he was facing Louisiana competition in the Sun Belt, and he is stepping up to the SEC. However, many experts do believe that he's going to do well. He's not a preseason All-American for lack of belief that he can do it at an SEC level. And at right tackle, we do have Michael Tarquin, penciled in as a starter at this time, replacing Gene DeLance. Now, DeLance was a monster in the running game. However, at times he could be a liability in pass blocking, and many times he ended up getting unfortunate penalties, had a few killer ones at Kentucky and other places that just didn't help us. So if Michael Tarquin can do a little bit better than that, this whole line will be an upgrade. We also have improved depth at the offensive line position, depth that we've not seen for a while at the University of Florida. We have Josh Braun, who may even make a play to start once fall camp starts. He had several starts in 2021, including against Georgia. And if you remember, or maybe you didn't get a chance to see it, his dad posted a highlight of him pushing around Jordan Davis from Georgia on Twitter. And that's something that not everyone did throughout the SEC last year. We also have Richie Leonard, who had a start last year against Missouri and also played in eight games, also had pressed for some playing time and starting position last year. We also have several other guys, including the aforementioned Cameron Waits. And Waits is a massive guy, at, listed at 6'8 and over 370 pounds. That's not a guy you want to go up against, and you cannot teach size. Now, one reason as well, besides the coaching, besides the added experience, besides increased talent along the starting offensive line, I do believe increased discipline will cause this offensive line to be better in 2022. And what I can say about that is, you know, last year, as I spoke about DeLance, and this did happen to other players as well. We had killer penalties, especially a ton of penalties, again, going back to the Kentucky game, 
probably a big portion of why we lost that game was having a ridiculous number of penalties, many of which being things like false starts. In the orange and blue game, we saw the line staying in place when someone jumped rather than try and react. That way there wouldn't be a false start or whatever. Now, some people look at that and they have nightmares thinking, oh no, we're going to have people staying in place like the guy in the 2009 FSU game that as the play's going on around them is still staying in the stance. I don't think we'll see that, but I would prefer to see them stay in their stance when we see the jump rather than all the false starts. And it shows me that these guys are disciplined and will continue to get more disciplined as time goes on, as they continue with their coaching from Sale and from Stapleton. A final reason why I think the offensive line will be better in 2022 is the new zone blocking scheme. It's more hat on hat and a little less pulling. In fact, the offense, if you go and watch, a lot of Billy Napier's pulling ends up being from a tight end who's lined up at a wing type position coming over and either running a trap or the pool or something like that last year at times before the guard could get even into the hole to help out on their pool the hole was already filled and those slower developing run plays kind of stuffed us at times whereas with the zone blocking scheme and the more hat on hat the plays move a little bit quicker develop a little bit quicker and will allow the running backs to get to the next levels at a faster pace it also can create hold choices for the running back so how many times in the past few years have we seen a running back run into the back of our offensive linemen and generally seem like they don't have vision i think some of that was being forced you need to go to the hole where the play's designed and i do think some of that is just sometimes the plays develop way too slowly and people fill the holes the defense has coaches too but with the zone blocking scheme and again, watch some of the orange and blue game, watch some of the film of Louisiana, you'll see times where a running back will look like they're going into a hole, maybe in the middle, maybe a little to the left, but something opens up on the right because the defense reads the hole and because it's hat on hat, because maybe there's that fill, they see it and they go. I do think there is additional freedom. And I think that's going to help this offensive line do better. And our offensive line is going to help the running backs do better, as I alluded to earlier. Now, moving from the offensive line to the tight end position, I think, and this is mostly based on experience, I think the tight end position for now will be a little bit worse in 2022. William Piegler coming in, taking over for Tim Brewster. I believe that's about a toss-up. Now, Piegler did a great job as running backs coach at Michigan State last year. Kenneth Walker was one of the best running backs in the country. However, we did lose Kamari Gamble, who had a pretty good year for a tight end at Florida. No, he wasn't Kyle Pitts, but really, who is? We do return Keon Zipper, who at this point has shown plenty of flashes, just hasn't put all together. Now, some of that may be just where he was on the depth chart. Some of that may just, who knows. But this year, Keon Zipper looks to be the guy, and hopefully he can step up into that role. Now, the thing is, Billy Napier likes to run a lot of a 12 set, which is one running back, two tight ends. Now, the reason why I bring that up is Zipper is the most experienced guy on the roster. With sometimes two tight ends on the field, you're going to need someone else to step up, possibly more than one guy to step up. And that's why right now I say it's worse for now, but most of that's just mainly with experience. At the end of the year, I could be saying this was the best position or the most improved position. We did bring Dante Zonders back from the defensive line. He started his career at Florida as a tight end. And he looked good in the orange and blue game. Now, was some of that by design to show off a good offense? Because let's be honest, if the offense looks bad in the coach's first spring game, well, it's not going to instill a lot of confidence. 
Whereas if you're throwing the ball everywhere, people get excited and that's what you want heading into the summer months and into the season. But based on what we saw, Zonders did look good. We also had Keeter looking pretty good, who's a walk-on, transferred over from UCLA. We have Elksinus and Odom, who did mostly miss the spring. Redshirt freshman. Elksinus played first four games of last year, then redshirted. We didn't see too much of Odom. Again, injured during the spring. Unfortunately, another guy we had on the roster, Gage Wilcox, had his career ended due to injury. Now, in fall camp, we could see one of these guys emerge. We could see them all emerge and have a great rotation in 12 personnel. I would love to see it. I would also love to see a lot of other things from this offense. So who knows? And also, we could see a guy like Arliss Boardingham, a true freshman who's just got on the campus. He could come in, step up, and he might show that, hey, I'm here. I'm going to be one of a long list of guys who made good contributions at the University of Florida as a true freshman on offense. The orange and blue game definitely was a decent start for the tight end position. But for now, and I can and will continue to say this could change. But until I see it, I do think the tight end position will take a little bit of a step back until I see that production coming out of them. Finishing up, we'll move to the wide receiver room. And I do believe the wide receivers will be about the same in 2022 as they were in 2021. I know I said I'd say better or worse. However, this is kind of one where I'm just not sure. I do believe Kerry Colbert is a plus over Billy Gonzalez. I did go back and forth on how I felt about that. I thought maybe they're a toss up. Maybe this is, you know, Colbert a little bit. I'm going to go with Colbert for now. Obviously, our most notable loss at wide receiver was Jacob Copeland when he transferred to Maryland. We did bring in Ricky Pearsall from Arizona State. In 2021, both Pearsall and Copeland had very, very similar numbers. Now, Jacob Copeland scored TDs in more different games than Pearsall did. However, Pearsall did show some explosiveness in several more games than we saw from Copeland. Now, with that said, Pearsall could show up and show out which Copeland, to be honest, if you rewatch the games, Copeland's best times were when Anthony Richardson is in the game. Now, Ricky Pearsall may get that benefit that Copeland got with Anthony Richardson at quarterback. We also have key returners in Justin Shorter, Xavier Henderson, Trent Whittemore, also younger guys who had a little bit of experience last year, like Frazier's, like Weston. We saw a little bit of Burke at times. These are guys that can definitely contribute. There's a lot of questions about this room. We know we wanted to see some improvement from this room, and I do think there's improvement that can happen. One question I have to ask regarding the wide receivers is, how much was it on them and how much of it was on quarterback play? And what I mean by that, let's go back to how I talked about ball placement and the difference ball placement can make. It's really hard for a receiver to do well if they're having to cut their route or slow down to catch a ball. Another example of this for Trent Whittemore is that Trent Whittemore in the big fourth down conversion he had against Alabama, the ball soaring a little bit behind him and he ends up making that grab. But because of where the ball is placed, he doesn't really have momentum and has to stretch the ball out. And to be honest, I watched that play and I'm still not sure he got the first down, but they gave it to us. So we'll say he got it. No questions asked. Great play by him. However, if the ball's thrown in front of him, he probably gets that easily, probably gets one, two yards of yak, maybe more. And we don't have to worry about him outstretching the ball in his arm. So little things like that could help out this offense. And another example, we talked about how Jacob Copeland looked better when Anthony Richardson was in at quarterback. That's just something that may make the receivers look better as well. 
where passing offense at times looks stagnated against some play, some teams like LSU. Then you see Richardson coming in that second half, and he throws it all over the place and, again, leads us on four straight touchdown drives. We've seen some good grabs from some of these players. Just to give a few examples, Justin Shorter back in 2020, and this is one of my favorite grabs because I said it looks like he's playing horse with um, Trevon Grimes. Grimes made a great catch, great touchdown catch against the Bulldogs in 2020 where he jumped through the air, kind of twisted, came down with the ball, touchdown. The next week against Arkansas at home, almost an exact carbon copy, Justin Shorter makes that catch. Justin Shorter, former five-star guy, you listen to him, he talks about, I've not lived up to my potential. I really want to live up to that. That motivation may help him get to the next level. Also, he had a great grab on the Hail Mary last year. It wasn't like it just landed in his lap. He actually makes sure he has his foot in the end zone and kind of has to reach out to the side to make sure he gets that ball. So it wasn't just the most easy grab. I'm not saying it was the most hard grab he's ever made, but definitely just little things to look that helps me believe he could take at least somewhat of a higher step. Xavier Henderson had a good touchdown grab from Emory Jones in the USF game. And of course, Whittemore's had a few good grabs. The Bama example I've already given is probably one of the best examples. Well, everyone, thanks for taking the time to listen. Before we go, I do want to thank anyone who's helped me out while I've been preparing the last few months to launch this podcast, whether it was listening to test episodes, whether it was helping me get a logo design, whether it's just simply encouragement. Thank you. Everyone, if you enjoyed the podcast, please share it. Please let others know. Leave it a like. Leave a review. You can reach out to me on social media. You can find me at either GatorTruth133 or this podcast on Twitter at GatorPodcast. Once again, thank you everyone for listening. And as always, go Gators. Gators.